Okay, folks, so I am so excited today um, that we are joined by Travel Harp. Um, he is the Executive Director of the Neighborhood Leadership Institute. Um, he is going to have wonderful things to share with us. I am also joined by my colleague, uh, Roger Sykes, who is a policy and advocacy campaigner here at Solar United Neighbors. Next slide. I guess before I pass it back over to Travel, um, I did want to take care of a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so if you want to talk amongst each other, if you are chatting with um, your friends across the country, please feel free to uh, put that in the chat. But we do encourage questions. So if you have questions, the best way to get your question answered is to put that in the Q&A box. So um, if you look kind of at your bottom panel here, there's a little Q&A section. Um, that's where we would love for you to insert your questions. Um, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to cover as many as possible and you have the best chance of having it answered by doing it there. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to Travel to take us into our presentation this evening. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that. And, um, and, and just welcome everybody to this podcast, well, not podcast, excuse me, webinar. Uh, my name is Travell Harp. I'm the executive director of Neighborhood Leadership Institute. Um, I have over maybe um, almost two two decades worth of community organizing experience. Um, and the way that I got in this work, um, I, I thought I, I never thought I would be in this particular profession um, because I, I started off as an introvert, a uh, technology geek. I, I watched Star Trek. I'm introverted, very introverted, um, um, naturally. Um, but some of the challenges in the community that I lived in basically brought out a, a, a passion for me to actually want to do something about it. And so that's how I found out about community organizing and how amazing a tool it is to really uh, build a social cohesion within community to actually address challenges. And without any further ado, Roger Sykes, uh, would you want to you want to come in, chime in and tell somebody, tell the people about yourself? Yeah, yes, indeed. Hey, hey, y'all. It is so it's so awesome to be here with so many folks tonight talking about community organizing someone that's near and dear to my heart um, and, and my life. Um, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be here with my colleagues at Soul United Neighbors and, and my dear friend, Travell Harp, who, who I've learned a lot from, both, both in working with them and just, 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 just making moves together. So I'm, I'm very glad to be with them. Just a little bit about my background, y'all. I'm a policy and advocacy campaigner. I work in our Heartland region, which is uh, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Um, but I've, I've done a lot of uh, different types of community organizing, largely in, in the state of Georgia and also in the, in the state of Ohio. Uh, I've, I've worked on issues around um, gun violence prevention issues, um, workers' rights issues, trying to raise wages, both in workplaces, but at the city level and state level. And a lot of organizing around grocery store access, quality, quality issues, kind of fairness issues, how grocery stores relate to community. And, uh, and now I'm working with Solely United Neighbors. Uh, just uh, building power and building advocacy to, to build uh, energy equity uh, in, in this country. So again, it's uh, great to be here with you. It's un placer estar con ustedes. All right, y'all, vamos. Um, and as, as Sarah said, don't be uh, don't be shy in the chat. Get, you know, we're, we're going to be checking that out. We'll, we'll shout stuff out there, and we'll try to we'll try to engage and kind of take note about what's going on in the chat. And I know we got hundreds of people on here, so. That's one way to engage and kind of get it popping. Um, so goals for today, y'all, we're, we're talking about community organizing. We're hoping to, to provide a basic framework for what community organizing is. What, what is community organizing? How can we look at it from maybe a few different angles? Um, and how can we maybe uh, pique, pique folks' interest, kind of get more involved and, and figure out how folks can use it in their lives? And with this beautiful organization of Solar United Neighbors. We're going to introduce the concept of power. What is power? We're going to interrogate it. How can we think about it, understand it, and, and understand it through examples, um, and hopefully examples that are relevant to, to y'all's lives. Um, lastly, we're going to talk about power organizations. Um, so these are the organizations that actually exercise power and can leverage change. What are they? What are some contemporary examples? What are some contemporary examples maybe in your neighborhood that you're not aware of or maybe you're already a part of? Um, lastly, we, we will do a couple campaign examples, again, to help just to kind of crystallize what, what is community organizing, why, and why is it relevant? So Solar United Neighbors, y'all, y'all are Solar United Neighbors, we're Solar United Neighbors, and, and, and we're together, y'all. So I'm just want to, our this is just a look at our theory of change, and we want to just kind of think about this throughout the presentation. How, how does this theory of change relate to community organizing? At Solar United Neighbors, we, we go solar, 
We join together and we fight for our energy rights. So unpacking that a little bit. One of our, the, our bread and butter activities, y'all, is, is we help groups, groups of people go solar. So, so we might establish a solar co-op in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so we try to outreach and work with maybe 50, 100, 200 families to, to get a group of folks who are interested in going solar on their rooftop. And then what, what we do at Solar United Neighbors at Sun, we help to organize those families. We help to leverage group buying power to, to get better deals for, for those panels. Um, we help to educate folks, but most importantly, we help to build relationships among those people who are in the co-op. So those 50 or 100 families, they start to know each other. They start to relate to each other. They start to talk, you know, communicate. And then also they get connected with our organization where we can ultimately mobilize those members, mobilize those folks who came in through our co-ops to fight for more visionary policies and, and, and build a world that's going to be relevant for working families. Um, and build an energy system that works for us, a democratic energy system that works for us. Okay, Roger. So so getting um, right in the subject of community organizing, uh, we can't really talk about community organizing if we don't talk about an unpacked power. And so real quickly, those of you that uh, have access to your chat, um, can you write down your definition of power and how you think it applies to community organizing? Just real quickly, what do you think power is? What is power? I see hmm. Jennifer says ability to create meaningful change. Okay. All right. I like that. Anybody else? Hmm. Don't everybody speak at once. Somebody, I think Susan says control. Hmm. Uh, Michael says ability to influence others to do what you want them to do. Somebody's been taking some community organizing training. Mm-hmm. Ability to, uh, I think Aaron says, uh, ability to influence decision makers. Do you see any, Roger? Yeah, let's say we shout out uh, Marcos. What is it? Capacidad de hacer y ejecutar. Capacity to, to do and execute. Okay. Okay. All right, if we could just uh, right. progress the uh, the slide a little bit. I see, uh, I see somebody, a uh, physical entity as in um, power as in power, electrical or hydropower. Okay, that's that's another way of power. And mm -hmm. so, so, so I, I like that. I think Jeffrey Shapiro said that. And so, um, in community organizing, um, power has the same definition as you use, like in the physical sciences. Like if you took a chemistry class or a physics class, they'll say the ability to do work. And so, community organizing is the same thing. It's the ability to act. Uh, Martin Luther King says the ability to achieve pur purpose. If we want to get philosophical about it. But it's but essentially that's what it is. And so let's uh, progress to the next slide. And so the question now comes on for you math majors, right? So where does power come from? So if power is the ability to, to act. So how do we in, in our social environment, how do we activate power in our community? How do we build power? And and the power equation basically says power is organized people and organized money. Notice, notice that we have. Or we have we have we have the noun and everything, but then we have the adjective and everything because it's not just people and money that equals power, but it's organized people and organized money. And so every institution that that we know about, churches, uh, political parties, businesses, every every everything that we know about in our physical reality that that's been made by somebody, whether it be the chair that you're sitting in, the computer, or the phone that you're looking or listening to this this webinar on. Um, the, the house that you're, that you're sitting in that's been built is some type of derivative or some type of combination of organized people and organized money to come, in, to come together to do something, to produce something, or to activate something. And so in community organizing, it's the same thing. Uh, we're building power. And so I, I see these little fishes coming up here, and I, I just know Roger has, um, you know, he, he has his, this affinity for fishes. Can you explain the fishes for us, uh, Roger? <laughs> I, I do have an affinity for fishes, that's right. Well, yeah, uh, just just keep thinking about the, this image here, y'all, and, and what and what it means. You know, we got um, when when all the little fishies are organized. You know, we, uh, when, when we're together, when we're going in the same direction, we can take on a big fish. We can take on a shark. Look at that. We're mighty. We're we're big when we're together, y'all. But then on, on the other hand, you know, if people are disorganized, if there's disunity, if we're divided along racial lines, if we're divided around uh, across religion. Um, or if we're just not talking with each other, you know, those big fish, those sharks, they're going to eat us every time. 
We get, we got, when we're disorganized, we got no hope. Just think about this uh, throughout the presentation. It, it's really basic, but when, when we're organized, when we're like these fish who are tight organized, we can do, we can do mighty things collectively. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so when we think about, okay, power and what it is, the power equation says organized people and organized money. Um, typically what we find is that, you know, um, you know, okay, so, so, uh, when we're dealing with the community and that kind of thing, that, that we look a lot more disorganized in, in a lot of different ways. And then and typically corporations are, are at a point where they have more organized money than organized people. And so that's why you see that, that difference between the big fish and then a lot of little fishes and that kind of stuff. But the question comes up, okay, we, we, we got community organized and we're talking about power, but what do we use power for? And so when we think about this, um, this, this particular illustration right here shows that I mean, it kind of like uh, illuminates to the, to the point everybody has some type of belief system, whether it be a religion or some type of faith system or just some type of worldview that you have and everything. And hopefully that's deeply rooted in some type of like, you know, manifestation of human dignity or values and that kind of stuff that we have, meaning that people should be treated a certain way. And so power, which is the ability to act or do work or to have governance over and that kind of thing is is the power equation is organized people and organized money and that power right there is used to protect your values and so if if you're a part of solar united neighbors and you believe that solar technology should be accessible to every human being or it should be accessible to the community or should not just be held um you know hostage by utility companies but everyday people should, should have be able to have ownership to that particular utility too then that, that's why we built power to protect those values. Now, when we talk about power in that context, everything, you can't just have power and just be willy nilly, right? You can't have power that's not focused. Power is housed in a vessel and we call it organization. And if you wanna be get more specific about it, power is held in a power organization. And so, you, so an organization provides an institution or a platform for us to protect our values through the through the relationships that we build along common interests, so that we can collect our so, so we can connect that to our values. Let's go to the let's advance to the next slide. All right. Well said, Travel. So so power organization, right? So Travel put this on our radar. Power organization. It's a vehicle to put our values into action for everyday people and for everyday people that have a voice in the decision that affect our lives. So let's, I just want to give some examples. When we're, when we're thinking about po power organizations, what, what can that mean? What can that look like? Um, a lot of times power organizations, they're going to have a membership base or a supporter base, right? It's power in numbers. So if a, a lot of power organizations will have a lot of members, or that might be a measure, a way to measure their power. Some bread and butter examples, y'all. Um, labor unions, organized labor. Um, that, that's a power organization. I'm going to call out an, uh, an example of the Service Employees International Union, SEIU. Um, SEIU has about 2.2 million members um, in the United States and, and Canada. A lot of their members are service sector workers, um, cafeteria workers, hotel workers, um, health care workers, home health care aides, um, a lot of uh, working folks. So SEIU, when they when they organize, you know, they might organize in their workplace. They might try to fight for better wages with within a, a cafeteria at Emory University in Atlanta. They might try to organize to negotiate a better contract to raise their wages in that workplace. Um, but also SEIU, they could do something like, hey, maybe we want to raise wages at the state level. SEIU might look at Ohio and say, hey, you know, we've got a fair amount of members in this state. How can we mobilize to, to push state government to, to raise wages? Another, another organization, just think of um, any, any faith groups or faith organizations, you know? Um, and, and we think about a, a, a church or synagogue or mosque. You know, how many members does, does that church have? And I'm gonna uh, give another example here. This is a First Iconium Baptist Church out of Atlanta, Georgia. It's a mighty, a mighty church, beautiful church. It's very engaged uh, with, with the community. It's, it's got its finger on the pulse. You know, its members are really, really involved in, in issues in the community. First Iconian Baptist Church has about 3,000 members, 4,000 members. Um, and, and a lot of those members are active. They have committees that, that try to address issues um, that are going on in neighborhoods and that are going on outside of those church walls. 
First Iconian Baptist Church, they've done a lot of organizing around Grady Hospital. Grady Hospital is in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a, it's a big public sector hospital, and it, it serves the people of Atlanta and Georgia. So when we think about First Iconian Baptist Church, they advocate to keep the hospital strong. They want to make sure this hospital is serving, serving the people of Atlanta and has strong services and people can access it. And so this church is really organized to to make, to make Grady better, to hold Grady accountable to, to the residents in Fulton and DeKalb counties. But when we think about power, and, and again, from a community organizing perspective, First Iconian Baptist Church, its members, they're based largely in Atlanta. Their members, you know, go, go to that, go to that church. They're voters, you know, they're buying goods, buying and selling goods, they're living their life in that city. So therefore that base of people is particularly relevant to Grady Hospital because Grady Hospital, there's public oversight, there's elected officials that are involved. And so when Reverend McDonald, who's the, the reverend at First Iconian Baptist Church, you know, when he makes a statement to the board of Grady Hospital and, and might say, hey, we want to keep this dialysis clinic. It's very clear that that statement represents those 3,000 or 4,000 members. So Reverend McDonald is not just, he's, he's not powerful as an individual. Awesome. He's awesome. But he, he's representing those 3,000 or 4,000 folks, and it carries a weight. It carries clout. Other examples of the Farm Bureau, you know, uh, organizing farmers to represent the interest of, of, uh, of farmers and small businesses in, rur in rural areas. That can be considered a power organization. Um, and there, there are many others. Hey, Roger, Roger, just a quick question. Because yes. Solar United Neighbors organizes a lot of people and community who who all want solar power and so they come together and they leverage their people power and their purchasing power to drive down prices so that so that solar can be more affordable to people and you guys also do things around policy to make to, to actually remove barriers out the way so that people can actually access and benefit from solar in other ways as well wouldn't mm -hmm. you call solar united neighbors a power organization you know, that, that, that's a great point, Travell. Yeah, we can look at us at Solar United Neighbors and think about us as a power organization, right? So we talked about, we, we uh, go solar, we join together and we fight for our energy rights. You know, and when we're doing these solar co-ops, we're, we're organizing a base. We're helping to bring folks closer to our organization. And just in terms of numbers um, across the country, uh, we have about 800,000 supporters uh, of Solar United Neighbors. So again, just measuring how relevant we are, measuring our, num our numbers. Um, in the state of Ohio, for example, we have about, we have about 16,000 members. You know, so how can Solar United Neighbors, how can we help to organize and support and mobilize those members to, to exercise our power and again, get some energy democracy and hold these utilities accountable out here? Uh, but yes, Travell, we, we certainly are. So everybody, listen, everybody, this is our vehicle for, for making sure that our values are protected through the power that we built through a Solar United Neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk quickly about the purpose of power organizations. And if you just populate the, the slide fully. And so, um, so one of the first purposes, uh, one purpose is to foster and strengthen a relational culture within, within institution to find and develop new leaders to build social capacity. And so, it, you know, community organizing and power relationships all are about the relationships that you build and then how you strengthen and how you institutionalize those different things so that you, 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 you have a platform to be able to advocate for what you want to advocate for. The, another purpose is to develop relationships between diverse institutions. And so we all know as individuals, we can't go by ourselves down to D.C. as an individual and, and have a lot of influence on what goes on in Congress and that kind of thing. But as we build a, the, the platform or the vessel for power through, for instance, Solar United Neighbors, and then we build relationships with other diverse institutions, you can build coalitions between organizations so to go fight for the same thing or to influence a, a organi organization um, that, that's, that's equal size or have equal power, that you can influence that, the organization to change your mind about something that affects your quality of life. Mm -hmm. And then to move into governance or the ability to achieve vision for, for the community and to create systemic change. Let's go to the next slide real quick because we're going to unpack this thing called governance. And so the, the, the desired outcome for community organizing is essentially this, is, is to get to the table. You know, there, there's a lot of conversations that are being had, but get to the table, get recognition so that we can negotiate our agreements and make the agreements stick. Let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And so this right here, if we could just populate the whole slide. This right here 
is an example of the public sector and what we and and what what's happening whether you realize it or not and so in the public public arena you have corporate corporations and businesses that that are and you have government and then you have the community and you notice that that the government and the government and the corporations are having these conversations they're having these interchanges and dialogues constantly and they're making decisions that affect your quality of life they're making the decisions that affect the way that you live the the amount of opportunity that you have access to or not and that kind of thing and so they're having this conversation and, and and while they're having this conversation you can see that the community typically are sitting off to the side some not even aware of the conversation being had but the, although they're dealing with the challenges that these decisions are are, are making um but 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 they but they're sitting there on the sidelines as spectators instead of sitting at the table and actually participating in that dialogue and so uh, oftentimes the the community is the most disorganized and they're rarely at the at the table when decisions are being made. So if we could just advance the slide just a little bit, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so the the I guess the scenario that we see is that you know we see that that big fish come in and just consuming us because we're not organized. I saw something in the chat where it said, "Well, you people do things in a disorganized way, don't have a lot of money. Yeah, you can organize people and not have a lot of money and, and do a lot of good things, but you're more effective." If everybody is focused on a unified goal, and that unified goal is found out by really trying to really find common interests with each with one another, so that when we we go against the big corporations of government and everything, we're not so easily divided and we're not so easily consumed by them. Let's advance the slide a little bit more. And so uh, I'm gonna let Roger because he really likes the fish. If he could just talk about this this illustration right here, with how how we're strong in number and how the little fish can eat the big fish. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just going back to the fish, y'all, and, and uh, us being organized. But the, the part of our core role as organizers, as leaders, everybody on this call, you know, we, we are organizers. We, we are leaders. Um, part, part of our work is, is to work through the divisions. There's always going to be there's always going to be attacks that seek to divide people, whether that be based on your neighborhood, whether that's pitting solar homeowners versus non-solar homeowners, whether that's dividing African American workers from Latino workers, they're all, there's always going to be divisions and efforts to, to to foment those divisions, and always as the work of organizers, it's always to to build unity, find common interest, prep folks so that we can we can withstand any efforts to divide us. So that ultimately, again, we we are, we're organized, we're aligned, we we have trust, and and we can move forward decisively and with power to achieve the the changes that we want to see. All right, so we're just going to go into to just a, just a few kind of fundamental principles, y'all, around around community organizing. And by the way, Jeffrey, I, I see your comment in the chat talking about a, a really nice campaign out of Florida to to protect net metering, um, and we, we are going to go into that a little bit, uh, Jeffrey. So um, you know, a little little premonition there. Yeah. So the first the first fundamental uh, principle of organizing, y'all, it's uh, that that the people who are directly impacted by the issue. Should, should be the ones leading the organizing, or, or maybe put another way, the, the people with the problem organize. That's out of the Midwest Academy, which is a, a wonderful training facility for organizers. So un just unpacking that a little bit, y'all, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the Atlant the example that I shared out of Atlanta, Georgia, First Iconium Baptist Church and their members organizing around Grady Hospital. In that instance, most of the members of that church use Grady Hospital, that's their main place for healthcare. Um, and, and so, so when those, um, those parishioners are, are organizing and advocating, you know, they're directly affected by this issue, you know, so they, they are sharing their stories, they're speaking from the heart and, and they are really leading, they're leading the charge around, around that issue. And there's a strength and there's a power, um, to, to those who are affected by the issues leading it. Um, another, yeah, j j just one other piece here is that, um, Along these themes, uh, when, when we we organize others to build leaders, y'all, you know, we we're um, organizing is not like taking care of others or ministering to others or, or being a savior. And, and what I mean by that, y'all, I guess an, an example is, you know, show, showing up to a meeting, or maybe you're going to a neighborhood meeting, and you, and you show up. When you show up there, maybe you're trying to solve potholes, you know, on, on the on your front street. Maybe you're trying to improve a park. You want to show up in a way that says, hey, it's it's so great to be here with y'all. 
I want to, I'm hoping to make improvements at this park. I don't got all the answers. You know, I don't got all the answers, but I want to work on it with y'all. I want to figure this out with y'all. So how can we do that together? Yeah. So Roger, yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up a uh, Muslim because uh, you forgot the fish analogy, right? And so, mm -hmm. so when we mean, what, what, so it's a bullet point up there that says people are more important than issues. The process is primary. Mm -hmm. And and the, the explain that is that like you know we can bring fish to feed people all day right, but 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 how empowering it is to teach someone how to fish, and so we want to it's so organizing is all about developing people. If you're not developing people at the end of the end at the end of the campaign, then you have not done it justice. Because if you develop people, if you develop and build the capacity for leadership within community, then the next challenge that comes along, they'll be able to fight that challenge as well. And so we we are about building power. We're about putting people um, in, in an attitude of wielding power within their community to transform their community. And so th that, that goes back to we're not here to take care of or minister or to do something for. This means that you have to be active participants in your own deliverance. That's what we all do and everything. That means that we have to we have to partake. We have to learn how to fish. And so it's really about not just the issue but about developing the capacity within the community so they can solve not only the challenges that, that, we're, that we're looking at immediately, but the challenges that we can grow so we can begin to face the challenges as a community as a whole, you know, in, a, in the future. Let's go to the next slide. So the second fundamental principle of organizing is about creating systemic change. Um, I always use this analogy. And so imagine, um, you guys, imagine uh, if, if, if you went hiking, if you guys are, you know, like to be out in nature and you go hiking, maybe you, you're going in the woods to go see the eclipse and that kind of stuff, but you buy a river, all right? And you see a baby floating down river. So what do you do? You go get the baby out the river, right? You, uh, you, you guys can raise your hands up if, if that's what you do, right? And then, you, then as soon as you get that baby out, right, there's another baby flying, you know, just, just, just going down river. And so... You go get that baby, but but as soon as you get that baby, there's another baby just floating down the river. And so what needs to be put in place at that particular point is a system to go get those babies out, right? So that's what we call social service, right? So we, we, we develop an apparatus because we know babies are coming down this river to go get that baby. But what community organizer says, uh, community organizing says that we need to do systemic change in this. We need to figure out why the babies are coming down the river in the first place. So while we got that social service set up to go get the babies, which is nothing wrong with it. And there's definitely a need for it. Let's, let's, let's go and see if we can figure out why the babies are coming downstream in the first place and, and address that. That's what we call systemic change. And so it's about changing the systems. It's not about um, doing a temporary fix. So how do we change the system so that our quality of life will be better? The challenges that we face in our community will be fixed. It's about building relational power in order to change policies, systems, and systems. It's, it's not social service. It's not community development. It's, it's, uh, it gets to the heart of the issue, relating to or affecting the basic nature, or most importantly, the features of something. So we want to change the whole system. How many people want to change the game? Let's go to the next slide. The third fundamental principle of organizing is a, a deep commitment to relationships. And so... Organizing by nature is about building relationships with one another. It's about finding common interests and shared interests. And community organizers do that often um, by building these relationships. We do what we call one-to-ones, which is about uh, 45 hour me uh, meetings that we have with, with people that we're really trying to build relationships with. And we're, mm -hmm. we're basically meeting with them and sitting down talking with them to figure out what motivates them. You know, how, how can we connect as far as like what they're interested in or some of the things that they want to do that, that we want to do as well, the, the things that we aspire to. Now, within those meetings, one of the most important qualities of those meetings are, are that we are effective listeners. In other words, that we're actually listening to the people that we're meeting with because we really want to understand what motivates them. Now, here's the secret. Most people live lives and they do not digest their experiences. And so you, you ask the person what they want, you think that they would know, I would even make the, the, this uh, more personal. You think that you know what you want, but a lot of times, when was the last time that you have like literally digested and unpacked your experiences to figure out what you're going through and, and, and why you do what you do? And not that, but what do you aspire to do? And so getting out of survival mode and actually having those conversations with yourself 
and with one another are important to really building those common bounds and those, those, those relationships. Because you'll find out that many of us have a lot more in common than we have difference. And there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of forces out there that really will push us away because of our differences, whether it be by race, whether it be how you was raised and that kind of thing. But generally, people want the same things. And so once you build those relationships with people and you build that relationship, then you realize that I can fight side by side by this person because we both want the same thing. And so we are so so at community organizing. We're about building relationships. We're about cultivating leaders and leaders. Don't get it twisted. Leaders are not a person who can talk well and everything and wear a nice suit. But, but anytime they get ready to do something, they do it by themselves. Leaders are people with followings. And so in community organizing, we teach and train the art of building public relationships based on self-interest for the purpose of collective action. And guess what? That's the most important thing we do. Let's go to the next slide. Well, well said, Travell. And I just, I just want to stop. I, I've seen, I've seen Travell, um, you know, sit down with people and 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 talk with folks. And one of the things that I've I've learned from from Travell and how he does that is that he he de he deeply listens. He, when he sits down with someone, that that other someone is at the center of the universe, and is listening to every word that per that person says. And and this notion of listening, it is it is a powerful notion, y'all. It it makes it makes people feel more human. It makes people feel well and respected. Just just being heard, and and really deeply listening. And that's so important in life, y'all. We got no, in life. I don't mean to be preachy about relationships. We got to listen generally, but but in terms of community organizing, that's how that's how we build relationships, we build trust, and then we act right because we're actually we're really listening. We ain't coming with assumptions. We 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 listening because because people always surprise you with with what they what they really want. So just yeah, just some terms, y'all. So um, yeah, just some terms to be thinking about when we're, when we're talking about community organizing. You know, one one is a base. We refer to that a few times. That the base of people, um, the base of people in an organization. If you're the Farm Bureau, you know, part of your base is. You know, rural farmers and small businesses that that choose you know choose to pay dues and 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 support the Farm Bureau organization. You know, base building uh, again. You know, going back to a labor union, you're, you're organizing new workplaces. You're you're getting more members to be part of that. You're you're building that base up. Um, it could be a block club or a neighborhood association. You know, so maybe you're going door knocking a little bit. You know, introducing yourself, trying to get more folks out to a meeting, and kind of building that base up. That's always fundamental, you know, and, and organizations with a mass base or, or organizations that have a lot of members, a lot of supporters, um, that's always something to keep in mind. Because, again, that's those, those fishy off that we are the many. And when we're organized, we're powerful. Um, decision makers, y'all, just something to keep in mind, whether when we're community organizing and, and maybe we're, we're trying to address issues in campaigns. It's always always be thoughtful about um uh, the decision maker. So the decision maker is either the individual or the institution that can either grant or deny you the change that you want to see. And so it's always, as, as we're organizers, again, we're all leaders, we're all organizers here with Soul United Neighbors, we're all organizers. Who is a decision maker? And so, and, and if, if we're trying to influence um, a, a state governor or a public service commission, or gosh, or a local city council person, we always just want to be clear with who that decision maker is. And it can change over time, but if we have that clarity, it's going to help us act right. It's going to help us engage the base of people who are affected by these issues and to actually move an effective campaign. Hey, Roger, I just want to interject. I see a comment that Susan made. Um, I like this quote by Shirley Chisholm. She says, if they don't give you a seat at the table, pull up, pull up a folding chair. I like that. I like mm. that fire. Thank you for that, Susan. Hey, hey preach. I like that. Thank you, Trebell. All right, y'all. So another, just another notion around community organizing is um, is, is picking issues. You know, how do you pick an issue to work on? What are some things that that we want to think about when we're picking issues? Because picking issues it matters a lot, right? You want to pick an issue that's uh, you want it to be specific. You you want it to be actionable. You know, winnable. Um, and ideally, the issues hopefully they're broadly felt. That's what I mean. Hopefully a lot of people in the community or in the workplace or in the organization that a lot of people are affected by it. And then, then lastly, if, if it deeply affects you too, um, that's going to be kind of the, the, the icing, icing on the cake. Because when we think about this, y'all, issues, the issue matters because when we want a working mama 
a working daddy to come out at 7 p.m. after they worked all day, they worked hard, you know, the issue has got to be so relevant to their lives because folks are stressed. You know, fo fo folks, folks are stressed. There's a lot going on. And so the issues that we work on, they got to be relevant. They got to really affect people if we expect folks to really organize themselves and to, and, and to make a difference. So I just wanted to just give an example here and just ways, ways to think about how we pick issues. First of all, it's all about listening and hearing and those one-on-ones that, that Trevelle just spoke to and just really, really hearing. But just th this example here in this photo, this is uh, in the city of Euclid, Ohio. It's, it's a wonderful city just east of uh, Cleveland, Ohio. It's an entering suburb of Cleveland. And, and in this neighbor, this particular neighborhood, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a real quality grocery store. You know, there's a lot of issues, you know, people trying to get to the grocery store. There's a lot of seniors in this neighborhood. Transportation was an issue. So so as you can imagine, you know, folks here, they wanted a quality grocery store. You know, it was, it was a real issue. Um, so so what happened? There was kind of a rumor that maybe a grocery store might be interested in, in coming, but it wasn't clear. And there might be an opportunity for the community to organize around it, help bring it, but also maybe hold it accountable, perhaps. But at this point, you know, it's, it hasn't been decided that anyone's going to work on this issue. Um, basically, some community organizations and the public health department, you know, put the call out and said, hey, we're going to have a community meeting to talk about this potential grocery store. You know, come on out if you, if you got an opinion. Um, so at that first meeting, 100 folks showed up. Uh, this picture isn't the first meeting. This, this is actually farther down the line. But at the first meeting, 100 folks showed up to the meeting. All right. And, and folks were pretty energized. There was a mix. And I, I was at this meeting. There's a mix. There's some excitement. There is some frustration. There's some wariness. Um, you know, you, you had one person threw up their hand and they said, ah, a grocery store would be good. But but his his, his wine aisle better better not look better than his produce aisle. That wine better not look better than the fruit. Um, there is questions. Uh, some, someone else at the meeting said, hey, who's the store owner? You know, why, why isn't the store owner here? I want to meet the store owner. I want to I want to know what they're about. Um, so someone else said, ah, I, I don't know. The, the last store, it, it turned into a big uh, kind of sh shoe store, honestly, and they stopped selling groceries. So I, I just don't know. Um, just a little more context to in Greater Cleveland at that time, um, we had lost uh, two, two larger scale grocery stores, both, both on the east and west side. Um, and so there have been a lot of media coverage around this. A lot of residents have been speaking out saying, hey, we need quality grocery in, in, in our neighborhoods. And I, I bring all this up to say that this issue, this grocery store issue, it was clearly a generative theme. It clearly motivated people. You know, people were interested. A hundred people came out to the meeting. Um, you know, people are engaged. People are getting up out their seat, you know, and that, that's one way to just identify issues, you know, when there's that excitement. And so that's an indicator. Hey, this is something to work on. This is something that people can will, will really organize on. All right, now someone in the in the chat already had a premonition about this, but yeah, we just want to give an example of a, a really wonderful campaign uh, that that Solar United Neighbors um, helped help to lead out of the out of the state of Florida. Um, you could write a book about this campaign. We do have a longer story for it. It's really interesting. It's really powerful. But I just wanted to pull out some pieces and again think about this campaign and how community organizing was related. What are some principles, you know, uh, in relation to this? So in uh, in the state of, in the state of Florida, uh, there's essentially an attack on net metering. Uh, you know what does that mean? So, so net metering, y'all, it's you know for, for any folks who have solar panels on their home, you know that that sun's flowing through, the energy is going first to your refrigerator, powering your home, but any excess energy that's coming in through your panel, it flows right back out to the grid, right, and it goes to your neighbor, or it goes to the synagogue down the street or goes to the school across the street. And how cool is that? These solar panels, we're, we're really literally powering our neighbors. But anyway, net metering, what it does, it means that the, the those solar panel owners, they're going to get credited for that energy um, that, that we're putting back onto the grid. And so we always want to make sure that that credit is fair and just, and that solar energy is, is respected. And so we want a full retail rate, you know, for, for that energy that we're locally producing and sharing right with our neighbors. As it so happens, utility companies are always trying to undercut that value. They're always trying to undercut the, the credits that solar panel owners um, are getting. And we, we see that across the country. And in Florida, there's a pretty uh, intense attack by uh, Florida Power and Light um, around net metering. So just kind of stepping back and thinking, so with the issue, you know, is it motivating, right? What is this issue? An attack on net metering 
Does it move people into action? Is the question. And then who's the base? Who are the folks who are directly impacted by this? Now we think about Solar United Neighbors, our core is, is the solar co-ops. We've helped families go solar together. And then all of our allies, any advocates, any folks who wanna get on community solar uh, and, and, and you know believe that, that, that solar uh, should be accessible to everyone. That's the base. And so it is, I would argue, it is very motivating. The, our, our base is directly affected by this issue, very squarely directly impacted. So it's something that is very motivating. And then lastly, when in this campaign, you know, we're thinking about decision makers. Uh, the, the decision makers shifted throughout the campaign. Um, first, you know, it started at the, the Public Service Commission. That's when the, that's kind of where the attack emerged. Then it kind of moved to a municipal utility and then the legislature and then ultimately the, the governor's desk. Um, just to talk about our base in Florida and how it relates to this, uh, you know, community organization and community organizing. At the time, we had about 50,000 supporters in the state of Florida. So we had, we had a, a strong, we had a strong presence there. And as, as you can see in this map, it's kind of a heat map. You can see where, you know, folks are, where our base is concentrated, y'all. And, and as you'll notice, you know, we, we certainly have density in, in some of the urban areas, but we've also been intentional about cultivating a base in, in more rural areas, more suburban areas. So we go, we've done in, uh, a number of solar co-ops in more rural areas to, to reach folks there and, and really build both an urban, suburban and rural base. And so, you know, through organizing those numbers, I just want to put out some numbers to y'all and, and how community organizing and some of these approaches can be put into action. So we, we delivered over 16,400 emails to the Public Service Commission. Um, we helped to organize over 2,000 phone calls in, in the legislators around this campaign. Ultimately, we sent over 128,000 emails in relation to this, uh, in relation to this campaign. And we had over 2,000 handwritten letters um, we had a rally um, with, with over 400 folks who came out. And so all these things were only possible because Solar United Neighbors has an organized base there. And we have many allies. It certainly wasn't just, it certainly wasn't just us. We, we came with allies, industry, and others. But uh, in terms of a power organization, you know, this, this campaign really helped to demonstrate that. And so ultimately, uh, Governor DeSantis vetoed the bill. Um, and that, that, was, that was largely through pressure. Um, an organized pressure and an organized group um, like us. All right, y'all. So I mean, we we've thrown a lot we've thrown a lot at you here. Um, we yeah we want to get into question question and answer. Um, so please you know put, put questions in the chat. Um, we probably got what do we got about 10, 15 minutes to kind of to get into some. We might shout some out that are particularly salient here. Yeah, Roger. I um I wasn't sure if this is something that we uh if we would be able to answer or not, but I'll go ahead and, and ask it. Um so Jillian said, uh, have panelists heard of positive social tipping points? If so, how can we create these or increase the weight weight of and support for certain ideas so that it reaches its tipping point? For example, it's been said that one of the principal reasons um that gay marriage has become legal is due to the positive social tipping point around it. Um once support once support reached a certain weight, there was no going back. So based off of that example, um, do you have any do you have any recommendations? Hmm. That's, that's a great question, and I definitely appreciate that. Trebell, you got any thoughts on that? And and so yeah, and just so I understand, it's like the tipping point. Like once we get once we get to a certain point, it kind of becomes it becomes the norm, or we get to a point, and 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 therefore that that is kind of like the dominant approach is that is that kind of the question like what it takes to get to that point yeah i mean i, I mean I, i'm trying to understand the question myself i mean i mean so with any campaign that i mean you know you have um allies that you build support with and then you also have like um sort of like targets that you're trying to influence to actually you know change the direction of like how people are like making decisions and um, and I guess what I would say is you have to take every issue and break it down to something um, basic and winnable and measurable, and um, and and then you just built upon those successes to kind of like get to, to get the outcomes that you want. And so, um, so it's like for instance, uh, if we took the issue of world hunger, for instance, and we said, okay, we want to end world hunger, that's a really big issue, right? 
And so, but really, um, you know, narrow it down to like, you know, uh, you know, school lunches or something like that, or, you know, some, something a little bit smaller that's attainable so that you can, so that you can begin to build on it. Because if, if you can't really define it, you can't really build on it. And then you build support around that. Um, you have to figure out like, you know, who your targets are, who makes those decisions and, and, and see if you can galvanize enough people um, and organize money and organize people to, to actually advocate for that type of thing. Um, and, and that's how that's how you put pressure on your target to be able to change um, the I guess the out to, to, to the outcome that you want. I hope that answers your question. I see some more. Yeah, I see some questions in the chat. Yeah, maybe if there's like local organizations for folks to to connect with. Well, well one, I'll say, you know, Solar United Neighbors, we got solar action teams in states across the country. And we'll definitely we'll, we'll follow up with ways to to plug in deeper with to Solar United Neighbors um, in a follow up email. And we'll also be sharing um, some examples of different organ uh, different organizations that do community organizer trainings. So I know th this is like a just a, a kind of snapshot, just a crash course, just to give folks a sense. What is community organizing? Um, but we are going to share some opportunities if folks want to dig in more and kind of dig into the art of community or organizing more. We will share um, some ways that folks can do that, some organizations that are actively doing um, trainings across the country. I see a question. We kind of spoke on it uh, before uh, before the um, the webinar began. The question is, what technology tools exist to help uh, develop people into leaders mm -hmm. um, and maintain relationships? And so um, I, I was I was speaking to actually Sarah about like uh, you know digital organizing and how um, it's something that's a little bit I mean is is more needed now. Um, but but I but I would argue there's definitely there's definitely those are ways to do a lot of outreach and engage people. Um, but um, there's a tedious thing around like really just building one on one relationships. I don't think there's a replacement for that. Um, that that's just like uh, you know meeting some, you know building relationships like you normally build relationships. Like a lot of community organizing principles are very intuitive, but as at, at the same time they, they become so like cliche because we don't. Like for instance, when we sit down with people and we talk to people, we talk to people every day, right? But we rarely listen, really, really, really listen to kind of like figure out what motivates people and that kind of stuff. And so I think that's something that needs to be done. I saw another question that said, uh, um, uh, where, where do you recommend one-to-ones to be conducted? I, I would say um, a place where, you know, uh, where you where you won't be distracted because you want to be able to give that person, um, you know, the undivided attention. Um, it could be at a Starbucks, it can be at a, at a cafeteria, it, it can it can be, you know, um, you know, in a community I'm at, a lot of people hang out at the McDonald's, don't necessarily go and get McDonald's, but they just, they meet people there, you know, at the restaurant and that kind of stuff. And they just sit across the table from them um, and talk to them. It can be, you can meet them at their home on their front porch and, and have a conversation with them. But make sure the conversation that you have is focused and that it that is you know and that that you're intentional about you know um, you know really listening to that person and and listening like what motivated them and and I mean there's just a whole training on one to ones that uh, maybe maybe we get invited back later on to kind of like do some um, do some trainings on it but like you really want to learn what motivates what what why a person does what they do you know the story about their life and everything uh, can can give you a lot of clues about what that what that looks like. Yeah, well, well said, Trevell. And I'm, let's see, I'm seeing some good questions in here. I'm, I'm picking one out from Julia. It, um, it's a Julia asks, can, can you speak to solar for, for rich and poor, large and small houses, tiny homes not having room for solar? You know, ways for large roof to share production ability. Yeah, I mean, great, great question. I mean, a fundamental, you know, question that we, we're always advocating for at Solar United Neighbors is, is how do we make sure that the that solar energy, the, the wonderful benefits of distributed generation and distributed solar, how can we make sure that working families get those benefits, that people in our community, working folks, get all get the benefits of solar? And, and how do we kind of democratize this energy system so that working families are at the table and can get those benefits? And that's that's a lot of the, the work that we that we do at, at Solar United Neighbors that, that we're all doing. 
I think a great, you know, a great example though, Julia, is, is efforts around community solar. Right? We're trying to pass community solar legislation. It's already been passed in about 22 states. We have active community solar campaigns where we're trying to organize and mobilize our members um, to advocate at state houses to, to pass community solar legislation. And in the Heartland region where I'm at, actually each state has an active campaign. Um, and shout out to Pennsylvania. They, they just they just passed um, community solar legislation out of the house. And it was act it's historic and that it's never made it thus far. But community solar, it's the basic notion where if you have a community solar array off site um, of other families who kind of live in the area or live anywhere in that service area, they're able to subscribe to those panels and get the benefits of that solar energy, even if they don't have panels on their own roof. You know, whether you got a small roof, Julia, whether you're a renter, or whether you can't afford panels on your own home, community solar, it's really going to open up um, access, you know, for the people. Um, and ideally, you know, when communities can own those community solar arrays, that's that's an even next step um, on, on equity and, and again, making sure that working families can control our energy sources as, as much as we can. All right, seeing uh, good questions in the chat. Someone asked about a solar action team in Texas. It's a great question. We'll try to we'll try to send links about the solar action teams in the in the follow up email. Yeah, and we so we don't have a solar action team active in Texas, but we do have an active volunteer program. So I'm going to go ahead and put that volunteer sign up link in the chat. Awesome, Sarah. All right. Yeah, man, I see a question maybe about yeah Florida again. The Florida maybe how we're protecting that metering in Florida. Well, shoot, we're gonna keep keep mobilizing and building that campaign that that Florida leaders already already took on and continue to base build and continue to organize. That's right, Glenn. Community solar programs to the rescue. Love it. So here's a question from Heidi. Um, how do we help motivate people to think for themselves and consider issues objectively and rationally instead of following rumors of, of popularity lead, um, popular leaders, um, I guess, leaders that, that lead blindly? I mean, that, that, that's, uh, I mean that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, um, and you know, oftentimes, you know, I mean, we, we got to just understand that there's reasons for things uh, to be that the way that they are, that that's not in our interest. Uh, I think I saw a comment up there about, I can't remember where the location was, but it talked about why, I think it was, was it New Jersey or it was some someplace where uh, solar panels, you, you're not allowed, the utility companies say you're not allowed to put solar panels on your house and everything. And then there's, there's, the, there's a reason for that because, I mean, because what motivates, you know, you got to look at what motivates the different sectors within our public arena um, is, is, you know, money motivates people, right? Money, money motivates companies. And if they can benefit at your expense uh, to, to, to not allow you to have solar panels, they'll do just that. Um, but, but one of the tools that are used by, you know, a lot of these different forces out there that are operating against your interest um, is propaganda, you know, you know, mistruths or, you know, and, and and then, you know, elected officials that you think that like are making decisions on your behalf, but maybe they're influenced by someone else that you don't even see. And so I, I would say like, like whatever uh, community that you're in and whatever you're trying to do, uh, one of the first things that I really uh, felt really important um, doing when I, when I did my organizing work in East Cleveland uh, is building a learning culture. In other words, so how do we really like sit down and study and do our research. Uh, we would do what we call research actions where we'll go out and uh, we'll have a team go out and actually find the real answers for the questions that we had so that we wasn't guessing or wasn't going off of rumors. Um, also, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, we spoke about one-to-ones and digesting our experiences. Oftentimes there's things that we want and there's values that we have that we that we say we live by, but we find we find ourselves not living by those values because of whatever pressures in our lives that we have. And so that's when agitation, that's when we should agitate one another. You know, when we say that, okay, like for instance, you know, I've been on a health journey for a long time and you know, I want to lose weight. 
and everything. And so I say I want to lose weight, but it, but it, but if but my friend Roger comes to me and talks to me and says, "What well, you say you want to lose weight? You know, I know this is whatever, but I have a relationship with you, and 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 you know, and you respect me, and you know I care and everything. Why why are you eating twelve donuts every day? You know, you can't you can't lose weight if you're eating twelve donuts every day. And so, what do you have to change about yourself to to live to make sure that you are reflecting the values that you say you have? And so that really is really, uh, you know, agitation is a really important tool in me organizing because it keeps everybody accountable. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would say that that that's 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 the way that we motivate people to like if you say these are the values that you live by, then 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 you need to live by those values mm -hmm. right. and act and act in power in it. So do something about it, that kind of thing. So that, that's that's one of the ways we motivate people. Well said, Travell. We'll see Sarah about 7.59 here. Yeah, folks, we are we are just getting to the end of our presentation. I did see two questions that I was trying to type an answer to, but didn't have an opportunity to get answered. So um, I will be sending a few of you out uh, um, a follow-up message after this webinar. Uh, other than that, folks, we will be sending a recording of this webinar to everyone who attended. So um, you can expect to see that within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and again, you know, thank you all for taking, you know, time away from your family or, you know, your free time to join us this evening. Um, community organizing really is such a powerful way to um, make change and, and build connections around the issues that are important to you. Um, because, you know, as we know, a lot of positive change happens from the ground up rather than from top down. Uh, so I just want to thank our panelists today, Travel Harp. It was such a pleasure to hear from you today. And Roger, as always, um, I always really value your insights. Um, folks, uh, please do feel free to sign up to volunteer with us. I know sometimes that as a citizen, when you have your own work and your own family and your own life going on, um, you may not have time to, to build your own movement, um, but we are, as Solar United Neighbors, always sending out different opportunities for folks to get involved, to take action, and also to, um, to, to make connections within their community. So um, we will be sending out a resource document in the email where you'll have links to um, everything that we mentioned um, earlier. So uh, I guess uh, that kind of concludes our evening, but I uh, appreciate you all so much and wishing you a wonderful evening. Thank you all. All right, y'all. Buenas noches. Nos vemos.